Uh, Nate, back to back, thank you so much for, for doing that. And now we're gonna take a little journey into the metaverse. We're gonna talk about what are the implications for data leaders about this world and how virtual is going to affect all of our lives and our jobs. Uh, the panel's gonna be moderated by our very own Joe Caserta. Joe, take it away. Hey guys, hey, good to see both of you again. It's been a while. Uh, hopefully we could do it in person uh, next time. Uh, but uh, yeah, so I actually, um, uh, Nate and I go back to, I actually found emails going back to 2014. Um, you know, so we know we go way back. We've worked at HBO together and Take Two together. And, um, you know, we're personal friends. I consider you one of my close friends. And, uh, and Samir, I actually did, went back to 2010. And I think we know each other from even before then at Equinox. And um, uh, so, yeah, both of you, long history, uh, great relationship. And I'm looking forward to this. Um, I, I think this is, uh, you know, we're going to do probably 50% of uh, practical experience and 50% of imagining possibilities. So it should be fun, open dialogue, um, not very structured. You both know me, I'm not very structured anyway. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm going to, I want to, you know, the, the topic is, you know, how is, you know, the virtual reality and augmented reality, artificial intelligence, you know, how real is it in today's world? And how soon do we think it's going to be real, like within your industry, within your business, um, within, you know, the, the world and the country? And, you know, we can go as uh, esoteric or, or concrete as, as you like. Um, but, but I'll kick it off with some fun. So, you know, I think of, you know, the possibilities and I know both of you have hands-on experience, you know, we all have built some stuff that's at, that we could all be proud of right in, in this space. But I think of, you know, the opportunity for virtual reality is, you know, helping people live in an alternative universe, right? In an alternative world, right? And you know, and if you want any evidence on that, people really want that. Just look at like the drug and alcohol industry, right? <laughs> people like to like live in a place that's not their day to day current reality. And so, if we can enable them to do things like try on clothes and look different, and you know, have possessions and buy things, and you know, if 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 we can make it possible, right? The market is, I think the market is clearly there, right? So, so I wanted to talk to you, you know, first, why don't we just give everybody a refresher for people who just started. I know Nate, thank you so much for doing two back-to-back -back panels, but if you don't mind reintroduce yourself, a little bit of your, your history and what you're up to today. And then Samir, you'll, you'll, you'll go after Nate. Sure, thanks, Joe. Um, and yeah, we, we go way back to uh, early days at HBO there. Um, great times. Um, so I'm currently the Chief Data Officer at Gannett USA Today Network, uh, one of the largest publishers, uh, actually the largest publisher for news uh, content uh, here in the States uh, with uh, publications also uh, around the world and products around the world. We're on a big mission uh, through digital transformation, as you can imagine. Um, prior to this, I spent a few years in the video game industry where I was the head of analytics uh, for Take-Two Interactive. Uh, prior to that, I was uh, the head of data science and, and analytics as well, uh, built out a center of excellence at A&E Networks in the television industry. And prior to that, I was a senior vice president in the content strategy group at HBO, uh, where we were leveraging data and analytics to drive some of our core business decisions around content, scheduling, marketing, promotion, uh, and the like. And that's where I first met Joe, and he did some really great work for us over at HBO. Thanks. Thanks, Nate. Samir. Hi, everybody, and great to see you again, Joe. Uh, so Samir Desai, I'm currently the Chief Digital and Technology Officer for Abercrombie & Fitch. I took that job about four months ago now, um, so, so pretty new in the role. Um, Abercrombie & Fitch obviously has the Abercrombie brand, but also owns and operates the Hollister brand. Those are the two kind of marquee brands. Um, and this is a new role that the company created to really kind of build on the momentum that they've seen over the last 18 months through COVID with D2C and e-commerce as a, as a retailer. 
Um, and as kind of the real world effectively reopens here, how do they, how do we as a business continue the momentum um, and, and the, continue to grow that part of the business? So, so that's the role I'm currently in. But prior to here, I spent about 15 years at Equinox um, and, uh, and, and ran digital technology for that business. Equinox owns and operates uh, SoulCycle as a brand, Bling Fitness as a brand, so portfolio brands in the health and fitness lifestyle space. And, uh, and that's where, you know, Joe and I first met, I think it was actually back in 2008, Joe, where you helped us build our first enterprise data warehouse, where enterprise data warehouse was <laughs> a very modern <laughs> uh, way to look at data back then. And, uh, and it lasted us about a decade or so. So it was really well built. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and so good as to you on that. But uh, that's a little bit about me. Great, great. So, so let's talk about, you know, what's, What's, what's fact and what's fiction, right? When it comes to using uh, AR, VR, AI with, with real life scenarios within your organization or even within the industry, right? If your organization hasn't caught up yet. So, so tell me a little bit about you know, what you're seeing um, and, and you know, maybe what your competitors are doing, what the industry is doing in the world of augmented reality, virtual reality and artificial intelligence. Go in any order. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll jump in on that. Um, so as you can imagine, uh, Metaverse is uh, a big concept that's uh, getting a lot of chatter in the video game industry. And I think video game companies are, are very well situated uh, for being leaders in that conversation and in some of the offerings And as we think through what is the Metaverse uh, and, and what does that look like. In the world of AR and VR, you know, one of the things that I, I, I think about is when you think about the Gartner hype cycle, right? And, and we're at that hype cycle stage right now for, for, for meta and for metaverse and, and all of that. And we're going to go through that trough of disillusionment here shortly, I'm sure, uh, as the, the hype dies down. But the question I have is for AR and for VR, what is the killer use case? And I think that the industry has struggled with that because VR has been uh, on the hype cycle for years now. I, I remember I bought my first uh, HTC Vive back in 2016, and I was just I and, and and I was I put it on. I was getting sick riding roller coasters uh, and uh, and doing those things, but I, I didn't find myself going back to it because there was no killer use case for VR. Um, and so, you know, if you think about what made the Apple iPhone so successful, uh, well, there was a killer use case for it. It was a phone. Everybody needed a phone, right? So everybody needed to talk to somebody. Um, what I still don't know exactly what the killer use case is for VR uh, and AR yet. And I think that that's what we need to uh, explore is, is what are we trying to really solve for with this? And you, you spoke about uh, a couple examples of why you feel that it's, it's prime for that. Um, when we identify those things and we need to test and, and go through that, um, you know, we've got practical applications of AR at Gannett today. Uh, in the world of journalism, you can imagine lots of scenarios where you can transport somebody to another place. Uh, you know, virtual uh, reality is a great uh, tool for that. We've used AR a lot within um, our apps, uh, and we have over, for instance, over 200 local news apps uh, that are all uh, enabled with the AR capability across the um, portfolio of Gannett Properties. And uh, if you think through examples like we've created AR experiences that tied into the Olympics this past year. So there was a big skateboarding uh, AR experience that you could, uh, you could experience within the USA Today app um, uh, as one example. Um, same thing for rock climbing as part of the Olympics. And it was really about education, you know, teaching the consumer, here's what, you know, here's what it's really like to be in the skateboarding park during these things. And, and here's how you actually go about rock climbing and, and having that person sit there virtually in your room through an AR experience and kind of walk you through that is a direct example of how we do that. But again, I go back to what's the killer use case, the thing that you can't live without with these things. And for me, at least on the VR side, it's being able to be in the same room as somebody else in front of a whiteboard. Um, something as simple as that, uh, being able to have avatars work together in a collaborative fashion in front of a whiteboard, that would be a use case for me that I would use on a regular basis given you know, all the COVID work from home stuff, but also um, just the distributed nature of our organization. We've got satellite offices all around the country, as you can imagine, because we're servicing local communities, but the ability to bring people together still holds value. And when you can't actually get together in person, how can you recreate that in-person experience? I think there may be some uh, some opportunities in the VR space for that. Yeah, um, I think you're spot on, Nate. And the kind of having that killer use case is really what takes makes one of these things really take off. And so 
you know, in our in our world, you know, we're our target consumer is that Gen Z um, consumer, and where we're seeing most of the engagement is in the gaming sphere, and so that's that's an area where I'd say. I don't know if it's a killer use case per se, but definitely an area where we're seeing this technology and these experiences being leveraged in a big, big way. And so we're finding our consumers spending, you know, two, three, sometimes more hours a day in, you know, on Roblox or on one of these platforms where they're engaging in these experiences. And so, you know, what it means for us is how do we as a brand, as an apparel retailer show up in, uh, in on these platforms? And and if you think about apparel, you know, it's really what you choose to wear is usually a reflection of your personality and how you want to be perceived in society and status and things of that nature. And, and so what we're seeing is people building these avatars and effectively spending, you know, real currency on dressing up their avatar, whether it be kind of beauty type stuff or, or t-shirts, clothes, et cetera. And, uh, and, and so that's where we're trying to, as a brand, inject ourselves into that conversation of, you know, how do you... Um, how do you create a marketplace almost for, for branded um, apparel or, or frankly branded goods in this space because, uh, because a, a good amount of money is being spent there. And as a kind of personal anecdote, you know, I have a nine-year-old daughter and you know, she would much rather prefer I give her Robux as a, um, as a, as, as a present for her birthday versus, you know, an actual toy or a gift or something. And so the world that, that, that generation of consumers is really, I think, adopted this in a much bigger way than probably the three of us here. Um, and so I think that's where a lot of the traction is happening and building experiences that are targeted for that age group and consumer set is probably where we're going to probably see the most benefit from this stuff. I think in the corporate world, as you say, you know, what Facebook's done and trying to bring that kind of meeting experience to life with their Oculus. I think those are all valid use cases as well for obviously a different demographic. Um, but that gaming area is where we're seeing the most and, and just kind of being able to build these alternate experiences uh, that these kids are living in every day. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah. yeah. Go ahead, Nate. Well, I was going to say, uh, yeah, my, my kids, uh, I got eight, seven and four year old and, and Minecraft is uh, the equivalent of, uh, of Roblox uh, to, to your, your, your case there. What, what I think is neat here, and, 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 and I think that this is relevant for a data summit like this, um, is that I think what you're going to see is that those killer use cases will emerge as a result of the massive amounts of data that will be enabled uh, and, and brought to these environments and the capabilities that that will see. Because the reality is, virtual reality isn't that new. This, isn't a, this is not a new thing. Um, the idea of a metaverse is not new. I mean, Second Life has been out since what, 2000? Um, so th this, this is not new stuff. Um, and in the same thing with artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence patterns have been around for decades. Um, and so artificial intelligence isn't even a new thing. What is new has been the explosion of big data and the introduction of that big data world into the world of AI. Data is what's made AI powerful. Um, the have, Having data at scale, streaming data, being able to train those models and those patterns that have been around for decades, but never had that volume of data to train them and really make them possible. And I think what you'll see is the same thing happen, uh, a similar pattern uh, happen in the world of VR and AR, which is as we connect these massive amounts of data and the power that you can unlock with it, you know, introduce AI into that uh, as well, you're gonna open up new opportunities where yes, Google Glass was around what six years ago uh, as an AR solution, and I remember you know the the Poindexters walking around the office with uh, the Google Glass on and and uh, thinking that they were cool, and 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 now they just look silly in retrospect. But you know, imagine though, like if that environment was fed all of this high volume, rich metadata wherever you went. So yeah. you're walking around a, a park and you're looking over and you're wondering, should I sit on that park bench right there? And you look down and just above the park bench, you see the last time it was cleaned uh, or the next time it's scheduled to be cleaned. Yeah. Um, or you walk into um, a social setting or a party or something like that. And the people's names are floating over their head. I could use something like that because I'm, I'm, I'm pretty bad with names. But for, for, uh, for, for, for that to happen, it really is about bringing all of this, you know, Internet of Things data that's been around for years, bringing the data platforms to scale. And I, I believe that what you're going to see is all of these new capabilities and those aha moments and those killer use cases emerge from the marriage of data with 
frankly, things have been around for decades. Yeah, I, I do think that I agree that a lot of the technologies are not necessarily new, um, but I think our ability to immerse in it is, is new, right? Our willingness to immerse in it is, I think the timing is right. You know, it's like, it's like I think about autonomous cars, right? People don't, for a long time, no one ever think, even dream of going in an autom autonomous car because they're, they're not in control, right? So what are the car manufacturers doing? They're, they're, they're introducing like ways that the computers help us beyond our abilities, right? Warning us when there's somebody next to us, warning us when we're getting too close to the car in front of us, warning us, right? You know, if the whatever, like all these indicators that we wouldn't necessarily see as humans. And now, so, so now we're starting to rely on them and feel safer with them, right? And then slowly but surely, we'll be able to let our hands go off the wheel and, and trust now that we've been, we've been trained and conditioned to be able to do that. And I think that with, with, a, uh, AR, I, I'm a bigger, I, I think that AR is going to have a longer life than, than VR. Um, but VR also, I think in, you know, what Samir said about gaming, you know, if you think of movies and the market for product placement, you know, uh, in like old school movies, like think of the, the opportunity for product placement teams where you can actually like, you know, buy virtual Abercrombie and Fitch garments right in halo right or whatever right it's like the opportunity is tremendous and i remember when we were first called by warner music you know warner music was record company records are essentially widgets where they did their their r d they call it a and r and then they would you know sell to wholesale to to retailers and you know it was very very traditional business and then when streaming started, right, they called, they, they're like, Joe, I don't even know if I, if how my sales are until I get my data feeds from Spotify and Pandora and all the streamer, streaming companies. And I feel like there's probably an opportunity where like Abercrombie and Fitch, where you're used to selling out of your stores and you know how to do that market really well. And now you're going to have the opportunity to have garments sold through games and through virtual reality experiences where you're not even gonna know those sales are being done until you get data feeds, right? From all of those external parties. I think data is gonna become so incredibly important and managing that data to record what's selling, what's not selling, where is it selling and all that. Do you agree with that? Or do you think it's too pie in the sky? No, I mean, I just to kind of build on that, I totally agree with that. And I think that's exactly where we're going. I think we're going to get there sooner than we think, because um, I feel like the space is just moving at a very rapid clip. Um, and, and I think another kind of dimension to this is if you think about kind of how the influencer movements kind of come about on social media over the last couple of years, I feel like that kind of same concept is going to translate into this metaverse space. And they're going to be, you know, people that are going to be followed um, and there's going to be a, a good amount of brand marketing and data that's just kind of being generated from the, the ability to for brands to show up in this space and, and leverage influencers in, in this kind of virtual virtual world. Um, and so kind of how do you track engagement? How do you measure those types of things? I think these are all things that, you know, um, brands are going to start to kind of have to figure out sooner than later. And it's going to get more and more complex. But um, I, I do think it's going to be a reality. Yeah, cool, cool. Um, new, I guess, a, a kind of a new topic. So internally for your organization, what do you see as the greatest benefit that's going to open up, you know, once this does really become mainstream? I mean, from my perspective, um, you know, working with the journalism uh, industry, um, I, I think the, the sky is the limit, literally. Um, and, uh, you know, being able to be present in places uh, or to experience um, you know, local news in different ways. It could be, for instance, you're walking around with a pair of those Ray-Ban AR glasses on and, uh, you know, all of a sudden you're walking past the store and there might have been some local news story about that store, um, you know, two months ago that might be relevant to you uh, as you go past it. To have that dynamically appear, um, you know, because it's tagged through the metadata uh, with location data uh, and to be able to create those new experiences that tie into the core value prop of your own organization. In our case, it's journalism uh, and news and entertainment. 
Uh, but being able to bring those things to life, bringing up, being able to bring consumers into that experience and have it part of their day-to-day, -day, I think is a really powerful value proposition, you know, as all of this data comes together to enable those types of experiences. Yeah, I think that journalism and in general, if you think of human behavior, like we want things immediately, real time, streaming, right? And we want to be immersed in it, right? And feel it like, what is it like to be like on the enemy lines, but not be in danger, right? And then we want to be able to share it with other people, right? That's the whole concept of social media. And right. if we could take that to the next level, right? And, and have the journalists be able to bring the consumers into that world where the journalist is standing, like that would be, that's, yeah, amazing, I mean, it, that's exciting. It, and, and, and the ability through like our Sports Plus app that we launched as part of USA Today, uh, launched in, uh, in, in select markets across the country over the past couple of months as a pilot, and the ability to connect directly with, you know, let's call them journalists uh, or writers, uh, but you might call them influencers. Uh, the ability to connect with those influencers directly in a real way, um, you know, through these types of technologies, I think is really powerful because you're right, uh, the ability to share that uh, with your friends and your network, but also to expand your network through these relationships with influencers. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, being able to bring that stuff to life uh, and put it right in front of you uh, is, is an incredible just realm of possibilities. Samir, what about you? Yeah, so in our world, I mean, I think the obvious one, and you already mentioned it, Joe, is the ability to kind of you know, create virtual product and sell that product, um, you know, in in uh, in these spaces. But beyond that, I'd say the other one, it, which is effectively the number one kind of area of friction, if you think about e-commerce in the apparel space, is having a good sense of confidence on whether something's going to fit you the right way, right? And you see this in the kind of shoe space a lot, and I think the shoe space is probably where it's probably most um progressed but overall that's a challenge and so how can you use augmented reality to be able to get a better sense of how something a piece of garment is going to fit and look on you and and you see it happening in the furniture space and in all those spaces you know th there's a lot of maturity i think there it's going to get into kind of apparel as well and that's something that you know we, we've been experimenting with snap ar lenses and things of that nature but you know I, I think if i look forward a little bit in my crystal ball i mean i think apple's been heavily rumored to kind of come out with you know a product in the space from a glasses standpoint and i think you know when that comes out and if it's got the right level of quality and experience that is going to change i think uh, the game and frankly a lot of these spaces and and, and in everything you were talking about around kind of just walking around the street and seeing you know data and names and things like that on people's i mean I think there's a, a lot of opportunity. Um, it'll be really interesting to see kind of what they do in this space and how that you know gives us a big step forward in in experiences that we can unlock using AR. Yeah, cool, cool. Yeah, that's exciting stuff. So, so I'll put you on the spot, both of you. So, so what what are you or your company doing today to prepare for this? Right. Or, or to live in this if you're already doing it. And, and if you're not quite there yet, what, what do you what do you think needs to be done? So we're, we're already uh, in it uh, with AR experiences that I shared before. Um, I think what needs to be done is bringing the data to the table um, and ensuring that the that streaming data is available. Uh, goes back to some of the early the, the earlier panel that I was on talking about data governance uh, and data taxonomies uh, and common ways of, of tagging things as simply as that. Uh, you know, are we tagging things by the same neighborhood or the same zip code or the same DMA or NDI uh, or whatever it happens to be? Getting to common taxonomies uh, where there's industry standards um, uh, around these things so that the data can be transported from environment to environment with common standards, common open standards. Probably, there's probably some standards bodies out there that we could we could talk about, whether it's through the EDM Council or, or something uh, uh, like that. But getting to common taxonomies so that we can make all of this data available in different contexts to different people, uh, so that it, that data is there about the, the dirty park bench when I show up because you know that's public data that was made available through common APIs with common taxonomies that everybody is subscribed to. Um, when we start to get to that point, um, I think it really allows for us to take what is more niche right now and expose it to mass possibilities. And I, again, it goes back to these aren't new things. Maybe the immersion and you know the, 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 the quality of the video in them is probably better, of course, now. But these are patterns that have been around for a while. And, and I really you know, am so impressed with how data has made artificial intelligence and that self-driving car happen. 
I mean, that thing only happens because uh, they've been collecting data from live human beings through crowdsourcing of, you know, um, clicking the boxes that have a, sign, a stop sign in it uh, in order to, to get to the next web page that you're trying to get to or whatever it is. They've been crowdsourcing all this data and bringing it together to enable that type of thing to happen. And so we need the same thing um, for AR environments to move beyond this niche world and even VR environments to move beyond the metaverse, which is in one uh, isolated area to something that's more open standards and broad uh, so that it's not just limited to one Roblox environment. Uh, it's not just limited to one um, you know, self-driving car. It's, it's, it's more, there's open standards around some of the taxonomies for these things so that data can just flow. Yeah, yeah. Get, getting, uh, getting unified, everyone to conform, right? That, that's, that's a challenge. Samir, what about you? Yeah, in our world, I'd say there's probably two things. One, um, we've been experimenting with kind of in-store retail experiences using AR um, in some of our footprints and, and basically, you know, being able to get extended product information using a, a lens uh, through Snap or something of that nature. Um, that one, I think, is probably kind of the more simpler, um, more of kind of a buzzworthy one. But I think beyond that, the thing that we haven't yet solved, but we're trying to figure out is like how you bridge the two together. So how do you take what's happening in this virtual world? And then how do you tie it back to, in our case, kind of the physical brick and mortar in-store experience? And, and how do you, you know, right now, these two worlds are pretty disconnected and they're pretty separate. Um, but is there, is there loyalty points that a customer can earn from buying our product in our store or e-commerce channel that can then translate into either some cryptocurrency or some you know, Roblox currency that can then be used to buy other types of virtual product uh, that we might be selling in uh, the virtual world. And, and so there's ideas like that that are percolating and we're trying to figure out how we connect these two things together. And I think a lot of brands are going to try to figure out you know, there's the cool factor and the brand halo, but then how does it ultimately translate to real results? And yeah. uh, and ultimately, I think that's hasn't yet been figured out. I think there's a lot of, you know, just PR around it. Um, back to the hype cycle comment, but uh, you know, we're going to, need to figure out how this turns into dollars and cents in a in a bigger way. We yeah. have seen uh, we have seen AR um, products uh, drive engagement. Uh, so so there is some demand out there, Joe. To your point, that you've got a sense that you know people want this stuff. Uh, because we and, and there's a, a bit of a cool factor that's probably still at play, the hype factor that's still at play, but that is translating into actual engagement uh, in in our apps uh, when we offer these types of experiences uh, as well. So so there's clearly demand for it and interest in it. Um, and uh, what we just need to do is bring the data to the table so that we can really unlock that next level, uh, if you will, term from the gaming industry, level up um, with uh, with with these capabilities. Um, but uh, it, it's today it is driving engagement for, for our apps when we do this. It drove engagement when we launched uh, the Fan Harder uh, marketing campaign as part of our Sports Plus app launch uh, for USA Today uh, earlier this year. Uh, we were seeing that drive engagement as well uh, by having the actual fans uh, that uh, were, were dressed up in Fanning Harder that became our billboards uh, in different places in the country showing up in your room on the AR device in the corner, uh, demonstrating their, you know, their, 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 their Indianapolis Colts shed and the Indianapolis Colts birdhouse uh, that they created uh, as, as fans of the Colts uh, right there in their own uh, bedroom. <laughs> That's great. Uh, but both of you mentioned currency, um, you know, you know, the metaverse vision is that there will be uh, cryptocurrency within the metaverse, right? And be able, one of the things Facebook is excited about is if it could connect the different virtual realities, if you're buying things, they could own the currency across the different realities, right? Um, it seems like it's, I don't know, to me, that seems a little bit blue sky-ish. What, what do you guys think of that? Well, I think the world of blockchain is uh, is just getting tapped, uh, and I think that uh, you know we we launched our first NFT uh, this past year um, uh, as well, uh, which is of course built on on similar technology and, and the underlying blockchain framework, and I think that we're, you're going to see a lot more of um, the blockchain model um, evolve. Uh, I think that that is really what will enable those types of currencies to exist, and we're seeing okay. an, an explosion of N of interest in NFTs right now. Um, uh, the, the non-fungible tokens, um, and it's all built on that um, that new infrastructure. And people talk about that as what Web 3.0 or something, um, where where basically you're federating uh, the infrastructure 
uh, and you're federating all of these things um, so that they can uh, create those virtual currency type of situations. So I think that that's, and, and that's all, you know, different architecture um, paradigms, uh, transporting data in different ways. Uh, I think that's gonna be a big part of the equation. Yeah. Yeah, we, we did projects with Ethereum, you know, years ago, and it's really, it's not that hard, right? And, and it makes it easy to exchange, you know, currency. Um, yeah, having uh, someone like Facebook control it across the different universes, though, because they're talking about, you know, their own, like, yet a different currency, right, which is, which will have its own market, right, which will be, which will be something, I guess, you can invest in, right, and and by I don't know if Abercrombie is 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 accepting blockchain as currency yet. Not yet. Like I think it's a it's a very active conversation though because a lot of brands have started to accept uh, you know crypto effectively as as form of payment now. Um, but I, I think I think the space is going to mature. There'll be kind of you know. Uh, more mature wallets out there, I think, effectively. I got to imagine the PayPal's of the world, Venmo's of the world will start to basically translate a lot of this and, and just make it a lot simpler and easier to kind of understand for the for the kind of common consumer. And uh, and I think once that happens, I think this starts to become much, much more, you know, kind of mainstream and, and commonplace as a form of tender or payment. Yeah, awesome. All right, well, I think we're uh, ready to wrap up. So I just wanted to... Uh... Thank you so much for, uh, it's great to see you both again. And um, thanks for your time and your insight. And I'm sure it was incredibly valuable to the audience. Awesome. awesome. Thank, you, Thank Joe. you, Joe. Good to see you. Nice to meet you, Smith.